Well, good morning and welcome to Burke Community Church. If you're visiting here in the sanctuary or online, my name is Michael Coffey. I serve here as the executive pastor. The senior pastor, Dr. Marty Baker, is away this week. He had a medical procedure and you should keep him in your prayers. It sounded pretty painful. They basically did, a, I think, an industrial strength chemical peel on his face to take away some precancerous uh, spots, and it sounds pretty rough as I've checked in on him. And so that's always a thing of concern for us because it seems to be a, a struggle that he has to continually face, and so always lift him up. But he'll be back next week, and so if you're visiting, by all means, come back and uh, hear Dr. Baker when he's back here. I want to call attention to an announcement already made that on the 23rd of May, uh, we will be having a congregational uh, meeting here. And it's important for all members to try to attend so that we can attain a quorum. And you can vote by absentee, but you have to deliver the absentee ballot to the church. You can pick that up. The elders are holding a informational meeting between these services and out at the information desk, you can get it. But it's important for the life of the church and the decisions that need to be made for us to have the members come so that we can hold that meeting and hold it properly. So I'll ask you to put that on your calendars to come. Why don't we start off today with a little bit of Bible trivia. What, uh, what is the most repeated command in scripture? Yeah. The most repeated command in scripture is some form or variant of the command to not be afraid, not be anxious, fear not, peace, you know, be still. Uh, and like a lot of commands in scripture, that one says a lot more easily than it does in real life. I mean, how are we supposed to live our lives without being anxious without being afraid how are we supposed to command how are we supposed to obey that command since it's the most repeated command in scripture and i think the answer is found in the second most repeated command in scripture you want to tell me what you think the second most repeated command in scripture is <laughs> second most repeated command in scripture is something like praise god or praise the lord uh, Variants of that include rejoice, rejoice in the Lord, magnify the Lord, give thanks to the Lord at all times. It's some sort of variant of that, just like don't be afraid, don't fear, don't be anxious. Uh, those are the two most repeated commands in Scripture, and I don't want to move past that opening point too quickly. I want to let it sink in uh, that if these are the commands that are listed more than any other in Scripture, don't be afraid and to praise the Lord, I think that the way to do the first, not being afraid, is to be directly obedient in the second, to praise the Lord. And I want to unpack that this morning and the connectedness between those two. But I would be the first as a pastor to acknowledge that many of you have trials. Some of you, because of physical ailments and difficulties in life and stuff, really compared to me, who I feel like my life is blessed, uh, don't really ever seem to have a good day compared to the day after day goodness that I seem to experience. The suffering you face may feel torturous. The sorrow that you feel may be crushing. The fear that you have sometimes about something that's going on in your life might feel paralyzing. And what I love about the scripture is that it's the most truthful and most practical guide that any of us is ever going to encounter. And so when we face these sorrows, when we face these fears, when we face these trials and trouble, he's given us a perfect word for us to have so that we can face them and go through it and grow closer to him. The scriptures are filled with completely unvarnished teachings about Sin, sorrow, grief, pain, betrayal, failure, fear, wretchedness. And so I think that's why it's even more important to understand the second most repeated command to praise the Lord, to praise him. 
I think God wants us to know that the simple act of praising him has the power to produce hope and joy within us, even during painful times in our lives. I think that's why he repeated that command so much, to praise him, to rejoice in him, to magnify him, to give thanks to him in all things. You know, he repeats things as a kind Heavenly Father, and if you're a parent, you understand that. If something is important, you've certainly repeated it to your kids a few times, maybe for years. Well, he's a kind Heavenly Father, so when he repeats something, it makes me want to pay attention to it, because I know that it's important. But I would not say that either one of these commands, even though they're the most important, I mean, even though they're the most repeated, are the most important. Jesus answered that for us. When he said that the greatest of all the commandments are that we love God with our hearts, our souls, our minds, our strength, and our neighbors as ourselves. Now, interesting, he seems to have only given that command to love God with all that you've got, love your neighbor the way you love yourself. He seems to have only given that command once, and that was in direct response to somebody asking him a question of which of the commandments is the greatest. And so there's the answer. It's straight from the mouth of the Lord himself. But these other commands, a heavenly father, just like earthly parents, is repeating. And so it indicates importance to me, and I want to look at it. The way that the phrase to praise God is most often listed in Scripture is simply praise God or praise the Lord. And so let me ask the most basic of questions. When he tells us to praise the Lord or praise him or praise God, what does he want us to do? I know he doesn't want empty lip service, which he's accused people that supposedly were followers of his of doing in the past. If you look at Isaiah 29, he says very plainly, he doesn't want empty lip service while your heart is wandering off somewhere else or just going through the rote and the motion of some sort of religiosity. He says, because his people who approach me with their words and they honor me with their lips, but their hearts, they're far away from me and their reverence for me. It only consists of the commandment of men. He doesn't want that. He wants sincere praise when he's telling us to praise him. What he's telling us to do is to truly look at him through the pages of Scripture and look at what he's revealed about himself there in those Scriptures and through our experience of walking with him, those of us who have known him as Savior for years, the experiences that he's already brought into our life until we finally begin to understand and see some aspect of the glory that transcends the mundane, the things that capture our attention, that snare our attention away, so that we look more and understand more of a glory about him. And that glory then produces a joy that we can't help but express in praise. When we actually praise him with true delight, for who he is, for what he's done, it not only glorifies him, it actually gives him pleasure. You want to give God pleasure? Obey this commandment to praise him, to praise the Lord. And then he uses that because the sincere praise based on the glory that we're finally starting to understand about the Lord, our Heavenly Father, is very evident to others. And he uses that to woo them to himself too, out of the darkness, out of the pain, out of the hopelessness that they have. The command to praise the Lord is repeated both Old and New Testament. It's given a little bit over 250 times in some form or fashion in the scripture. That's how often he repeats it in some manner. And yet I find that the idea of praising the Lord is oftentimes misunderstood. People think that just because they say praise the Lord or hallelujah, which is from the Hebrew for praise the Lord, that they're praising God. And I won't say that they aren't, but usually when you see a phrase in scripture about praising the Lord, it's connected. It has itself wedded to something he's done or who he is. It has a specific action he's done or it has an attribute of his that he's being praised for. And to understand that, you know, all I have to do is take it down to a human level and you'll understand what I'm saying. If you wanted to praise your father for being a good father, 
you could just walk up to them or in the house with all your uh, siblings or your wife or whatever and say, praise dad. <laughs> kind of falls a little flat without some sort of context uh, to the thing. But if you were to tell them, dad, I really want to praise you because you're a man of love and compassion. Dad, I really want to just exalt you uh, for a moment because you've been a wonderful dad to me. You've always taken time to listen to me. You've always made time for me. It's a connectedness and then it's a lifting up because of who he is and what he's done for you. It's the same here with your heavenly father. The command to praise the Lord is just that, a command to praise him. And by doing that, we're saying praiseworthy things about him. And you find this regularly in the scriptures. James, back in the control booth, I told him he was going to have carpal tunnel syndrome because we were going to fly through a few scriptures here today. So if you blink, you're going to miss a couple of them here. But let's look at a few examples. In Psalm 117, it says, praise the Lord. Why? Doing a connectedness here. Why? For his merciful kindness is great toward us, and the truth of the Lord endures forever. Psalm 150, praise him. Why? For his mighty acts, praise him according to his excellent greatness. Isaiah, we're told, I will praise your name. Why am I going to praise your name? For you have done wondrous things. Jeremiah, he says, praise the Lord. Why? For he's delivered the life of the poor from the hand of evildoers. In the Gospel of Luke, it says, all the people, when they saw it, it, what is it? It was the healing of a blind man. When they saw it, spontaneous praise erupted to God. It's a praise for who he is and what he's done. So you could say that I think praising God is more than just a feeling. Praising God is a volitional, it's a conscious activity. We praise him by choosing to lift up his goodness, his greatness, his majesty, his love, his grace, his mighty deeds on our behalf. And so I don't think that merely saying the phrase praise the Lord or hallelujah is probably the best way to praise the Lord. That's just my opinion. I think it's better to praise the Lord with a conscious admiration and thanks for who he is. And what he's done. So the next time somebody comes up to me and says, praise the Lord, I'm going to probably say, because he's good. <laughs> I'm going to go ahead and help him out. They just commanded me to praise the Lord. I'm going to do it, but I'm going to do it the way I see in Scripture that, well, let's put something on there. Because he is good. Because he's great. Because he's all powerful. So that's one way that it, he repeats and he says that we are to obey and that's to praise the Lord. Another way that's recorded in the scripture is with the word rejoice. So praise the Lord or rejoice, it's just a variant of it. And when he commands us to rejoice, what does he want? Same question I asked about praise the Lord. What does he want? Well, here again, we're gonna fly through a few scriptures. He wants us to remember that no matter what happened, God loves us. He died for us. He sought us while we were still sinners and enemies toward him. Romans 5, 8. He wants us to rejoice always that though a mother may forget her nursing child if such a thing was possible, it's not possible for him. He is incapable of ever forgetting that he has claimed us as his own, according to Isaiah. He wants us to rejoice that nothing will ever separate us from his omnipotent love for us in Christ. Romans, excuse me, Romans 8. And Romans 8 continues that he will work all things together for our good. And a promise in Philippians 1 that he is going to complete the good work that he has begun in us. What is there not to rejoice about? This is just a handful of verses in the scripture. Praise the Lord and rejoice in him. Always, when we express our love for God as we faithfully rejoice that his sovereign reign over all things, hopefully including our lives, so therefore the sweet and the bitter things that are in our life, then we're truly loving others because we're going to be helping them to come to a point of belief. If it's a Christian, help them grow and mature to the point that they also can rejoice in God's sovereign power and his love 
just as we've learned to do. So praise the Lord is a commandment. A variant of that, rejoice. Rejoice in the Lord always is a variant, but it's the same command. It's the same intentionality. A third one that's listed in Scripture is to give thanks. Give thanks at all times. So praise the Lord, rejoice, give thanks. When God commands us to give thanks, what does he want? Same question I've asked on the other two. What does he want when he tells us to give thanks? I can tell you what he doesn't want. He doesn't want you to give thanks the way that you force your six-year-old to thank a grandparent because they gave him some black socks for Christmas. Thanks. <laughs> you know, that's not what he's looking for when he's uh, saying give thanks at all times. In fact, he wants us to look past the things that frustrate us, sometimes make us angry, disappoint us, discourage us, sadden, even depress us at times, until we're able to see that his grace the grace that's flowing to us right now, the grace that's flowing through us right now, no matter what our circumstances, have always been there for our good. 1 Thessalonians 5.18 says very clearly that in everything, not some things, not just the good things, but in everything, give thanks. Why? For this is the will of God for you in Christ Jesus. Your present circumstances have not caught the Lord unaware. He was not napping and suddenly like, oh my gosh, what just happened down there? This is God's perfect will for you. Whatever you're experiencing right now, no matter how hard it might seem to you to accept that. That's why I love the Psalms as Marty has been leading us through that because so many of the Psalms of David, when he's done nothing wrong, but he's being hunted, he's having to live this homeless existence in the wilderness, he's got all this ragtag band of people that have got all sorts of issues that are looking to him to take care of them and lead them. And he's got trials and troubles, and he comes very close to death time and time again as a mad king is after him. And so, so many of the Psalms start off pretty much the same way that, hello, do you realize what's going on down here? Do you see the plight I'm in? Do you see how much trouble is visiting upon me and how much danger I'm in? And let me help you, God. The dead don't praise you. So, could I start to reflect about the goodness of the Lord, how he's delivered me, how I'm still alive, how he cares for me? And then the psalm ends in giving thanks even in all things. Now the next psalm might start the exact same way. Hello, do you understand what's going on down here? But then he works through the same pattern of reflecting and remembering and meditating, and it yields to giving thanks and rejoicing in the Lord. Because it is possible to praise the Lord to rejoice in the Lord, to give thanks in the Lord in hardship. Let me repeat that. It is possible to praise the Lord in hardship. In one sense, as I already said, it's a choice. It's not a feeling. It might become a sort of personal battle cry. When our run is slowed to a crawl, our shout has died down to a whimper, we can still wait on our good heavenly Father with fierce expectation. He is faithful and he is true. If we can't praise him for our circumstances, we can learn to praise him while we are experiencing our present circumstances. When I first went into the ministry, I worked as a missionary with a collegiate group called Campus Crusade for Christ. Now it's called Crew. And I was working down here at Virginia Tech at in this illustration I'm about to tell you. And God decided to knock some rough edges off of me early on in my ministry life uh, to make sure that I was, I guess, doing ministry for right reasons, other things to mature me for whatever reason. And his infinite wisdom, I don't know that I'll ever know until I'm actually with him all the reasons. But one of the things he decided to do was to give me the actual worst financial support team in the history of missions. <laughs> I... You know, Campus Crusade deliberately kept you on a salary basis down around poverty level. That was intentional. Anyway, I didn't even have that. There were a couple of years I was living on around $10 a day because 
People, most of my supporters who had pledged $5 a month would not even send the $5 a month in. And it was a rough time, I won't kid you. And I, I would cry out to the Lord, what are you doing? I'm just trying to serve you. And so I'm driving a uh, male college student from point A to point B uh, down there in Blacksburg. And in my wrecked Pinto, which is a fire trap anyway, and it's wrecked on three sides, and we're sitting at a traffic light. And suddenly, the clutch cable, um, you know, all you guys that really like to work on cars, it just snapped. Boom, the clutch, you know, limply falls to the floor. The car lurched about three times and died about part of the way in the intersection. And uh, I thought, oh boy. So he got out with me and we pushed the heap out of the intersection <laughs> into the grass on the side of the road. And then we started walking toward town. Now, he was excited that I was spending time with him as a uh, staff member, and so he was talking. And frankly, I don't remember a word the guy said. I mean, I was, uh, I'm walking along. My attitude was not great that I don't have the money for this, and I'm not the best mechanic in the world, and I don't know how I'm going to fix this. And he's talking, and finally I just turned to him while he was mid-sentence and said, Hey! This is not only bad, this is supernaturally bad. So we've got to sing a song. And I started singing a uh, hymn, and he joined with me as we were walking down the road singing a hymn together and uh, trying to be obedient, to give thanks in all things. I didn't feel like giving thanks. I was making a volitional choice to do it. Interestingly enough, that guy later on went into full-time ministry and he pointed back to that moment that that was the moment I decided that I wanted to go into full-time ministry. And I'm like, seriously? <laughs> you should have probably felt like you should have run the other way or something, but that was it. Now that's interesting because according to Romans, he does work everything for good. Now, financially, he didn't suddenly just have a donor think, oh, I'm so sorry, I've never given you hardly a dime, I promise. Here's an no new car appeared for me. I think as I recalled, I ended up uh, crawling underneath a wrecked pinto in a junkyard somewhere, taking off a used clutch cable because that was about all I could afford to be able to try to repair the thing. But the kingdom of God benefited and that another laborer went into the harvest because of being obedient to give thanks in all things. Because true joy, um, you know, they don't originate within us. It's the grace of God, true joy. So let me tell you that no matter how difficult your life may be, no matter how difficult it may become, we can always praise and thank God because he is worthy. We can give thanks in all things. You doubt that? I have two words for you to prove it. Cross and resurrection. Those are enough for you to give thanks to Almighty God for the rest of your days, to rejoice in him always, to praise the Lord forever. Cross and resurrection. You may be in terrible pain, but you can still pour out your hurting heart to your Heavenly Father in prayer, and then by faith, volitionally choose to say, I'm still going to praise you. You are my hope. You are faithful to help me. You are my God. Whether I understand what's going on, whether I ever understand it, with an answer or without an answer, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. What's the most repeated command in Scripture? Don't be afraid. Fear not. What's the second most repeated command in Scripture? Praise the Lord. Praise God. So let's look at some practical applications for this. What is God's command for all Christians? Hebrews 13 tells you, Through him then, let's continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God. That is the fruit of our lips, praising his name. Always be praising. How did a man like David become a man after God's own heart? What did he do? How did he choose to live? says, I will bless the Lord when? At all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. And God said, now that is a man chasing after my heart. I will bless the Lord at all times. 
What was the practice of the first Christians after Pentecost? It says that they were continually in the temple praising God after the resurrection. They were there. They were telling about the resurrection of Christ. They were continually praising him. And the church grew exponentially simply by that simple obedience of being there and praising God. What is God's will for every Christian? I right, gave it to you in 1 Thessalonians 5.18. God's will for every Christian is in everything give thanks. Why? Because this is the will of God for you in Christ Jesus. What's proof that you're truly filled with the Spirit? The command is to be filled with the Spirit. The follow-on verse in verse 20 says, Always giving thanks for all things in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to God and our Father. Always giving thanks. You know, you're a member of the royal priesthood as a follower of Christ. You are a priest. Doesn't matter if you're man, woman. You're a member of the royal priesthood. What's your chief function? You're a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people of God's own possession. Why? So that you may proclaim the excellencies of him. What did he do? He called you out of darkness into marvelous light. And you're, as a priest, to proclaim those excellencies of his. What's the way that Christians should begin every church service? How is it that we should begin the church services that we do here in Burke, Virginia? Enter his gates with thanksgiving, his courtyards with praise. Give thanks to him. Bless his name. That's why I appreciate the praise man so much. What's a Christian's duty as long as he or she can draw a breath of life? What's your duty? Psalm 150. Everything that has breath shall praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. And what's a habit to be practiced all day long by Christians? All day long. Psalm 113. From the rising of the sun to its setting, the name of the Lord is to be praised. Let's do that now. We praise you, Almighty God, that you've given us such wonderful gifts as a perfect scripture that we can study and we can understand. Thank you for the repetition. We may be slow in mind and heart, but we hear you today that we are not to be afraid. We are instead to praise you in all things, in all circumstances, and rejoice in you forever. How could we not, you who loved us and died for us, we say collectively as a people of God, praise the Lord. Amen.